um, Cushing didn't actually uh, innovate much for the uh, pituitary approach uh, transnasally, but he used it in over 200 cases. He used Halstead's approach, the submucosal dissection, a bivalve speculum, much is very similar to what we use uh, up till just recently. Um, and he published a very low morbidity and mortality for over 200 patients. It was really remarkable, but since he was trying to promulgate transcranial approaches at the time, he felt that the, the transcranial approaches from above gave him better view of the uh, supracellular cistern and control of the optic nerve decompression. And so um, he actually abandoned the approach and uh, Norman Dott in Edinburgh continued to do it uh, during the time that Cushing had really uh, abandoned the approach in America and all the American neurosurgeons followed suit. He taught it to Guillot in Paris, who's a brilliant man, and then uh, taught it to Jules Hardy from Montreal, uh, who really, uh, and Hardy and Guillot uh, really repopularized the approach and brought it into the modern day with using the microscope and uh, illumination. Uh, also fluoroscopy to really verify where they were. Um, Guillaume was a brilliant fellow. He uh, worked with Tessier in Paris in craniofacial approaches. He did stereotaxis, and uh, he was the first one to use an endoscope in, in a trans uh, in an, uh, transphenoidal surgery in 1962. So predated probably by two decades, most people. Um, the interesting thing is I grew up in uh, Canada. I went to school at McGill. And, uh, and Hardy was one of my mentors. And, um, and uh, we wrote a, uh, a historical vignette on Guillaume and Hardy. And then, uh, and then Hardy and I wrote a uh, historical vignette on Guillaume um, uh, with all the contributions that he made. He's really, I think, a, a hero in our specialty. And um, it's really been an honor. Um, Hardy was in his heyday when I was a medical student and uh, told me much of the history. And then uh, also Marty Weiss, I wanted to acknowledge. Um, so let's talk about giant tumors. Uh, the definition that we use is larger than four centimeters in, in diameter. And they account for five to 15% of pituitary adenomas. And that's pretty much what it is in my own series. I have over 3,000, about 3,500 cases now that I've done. The pituitary tumors are very common, but they're usually they're microadenomas and they're incidentalomas. Uh, they're very common in the general population, almost 17% in autopsy studies. But we don't really understand why, if the, if the microadenomas are so prevalent in the general population, uh, these giant pituitary tumors are not very frequent. Um, <clears throat> this is the presentation of them, endocrine dysfunction and visual disturbance. Um, and we treat all prolactin tumors medically, even regardless how big they are, uh, only occasionally will operate on an apoplectic uh, prolactinoma. Um, I think that really the issue with, with operating on these tumors is the delivery. And I use this analogy as uh, suggested by Atul Goel. I think it's a good analogy. Most of the time we're able to finesse a lot of these large tumors down because they're soft and we can use different techniques to try and get them to drop. And I'd like to talk about how I do that. Um, it is remarkable to me that you can have a tumor that's this size and compress the pituitary stalk and the chiasm, and you have preservation of pituitary function, even though you have such an atrophic and wispy stalk here, and the pituitary gland is mostly um, atrophic as well, but they can retain pituitary function, which really indicates to me it's quite a uh, resilient uh, uh, structure. So the few tricks that I use, this is a, uh, from one of Hardy's original diagrams. I don't use the opening of the, of the cross. I use an X or I remove the dura itself uh, from carotid to carotid on these giant tumors. So the way you get a, a roof to drop is you take out the floor of the house and you take out the walls of the house and then the roof will drop. And so that's the analogy that I use, and we have to open widely to be able to get them to come down. I have a series of 108 giant tumors that's just being published in the Journal of Neurosurgery right now. It's in press, and this is a diagram from that picture or from that paper, but it shows you the technique that I use. And the ones that you're most likely to get to drop transphenoidally 
whether it's an endoscope or microscope, you, you want to get the roof of the tumor to come down. And so what I do is I open up the dura widely, as I mentioned. And then once you do that, you start to work around the perimeter and you identify the arachnoid. And the whole idea is that you want the diaphragm and the arachnoid to maintain and be intact as long as possible because the CSF pressure is going to allow you, is going to be your friend and it's going to help push the tumor down. And so we concentrate on removing tumors in the gutters and on the back wall. And then you'll see the diaphragm start to herniate down into the field. Try to be careful. Don't break the diaphragm. Remove the tumor inferiorly, remove the tumor laterally, and it will start to come down and capitulate. And ultimately, then you're left with a completely everted uh, diaphragm. It looks like an inverted, uter everted uterus um, and, a, and a herniation of this diaphragm down into the field. And you can see where the pituitary stalk comes through the diaphragm at this level. So this is what you're trying to achieve. So try to maintain, be careful, Try to be gentle with the diaphragm and not get a CSF leak because we'll use some tricks from above to be able to help push it down. So as I said, remove the floor, remove the walls, leave the center for last. We'll use Valsalva very commonly with, with anesthesia. And then uh, as something Ed Laws taught me is that you, if you bilaterally occlude the jugular veins and you can just do it yourself or, um, or have your assistant do it, uh, it actually is sort of an uber um, a Valsalva, and it really increases the intracranial pressure, and you'll be able to um, see some consequences from that as well. So what are your surgical options for removing these big tumors? You can use a single transmodal approach, and I'll use that for tumors that I think that will drop. But if I don't think the tumor will drop, I'll tell you how, what we'll do. Uh, and uh, the advantages and disadvantages, you can use a transcranial approach as well. And these are listed here. And you can do a combined approach as well. Uh, I've done this a few times. Um, in general, uh, you'll see what my philosophy is by the end of this talk about these tumors. I always am concerned about contaminating a perfectly clean approach from above with a more contaminated approach from below. But I have had no problems with infection uh, myself with that. So this is the historical uh, view of the mortality and morbidity of these giant adenomas in the literature. And you can see they had very high mortality originally. It's improved, but it's still high. And why is that? Um, the extent of resection is fairly low as well, and I'll show you why. Um, if you look at the most recent uh, review uh, of the literature, um, you can see the near total tumor exceed was in 74%, and the mortality still remained high at 4.4%. This is a systematic review. Uh, gross total resections were improved a little bit with the endoscope over the trans, uh, uh, transphenoidal, um, of the microscopic transphenoidal, and <clears throat> these visual improvements were also uh, better using the endoscope uh, if possible. The endoscope enhances removal for obvious reasons. So let me just show us briefly give you the results of our series. Um, we looked at um, uh, tumors greater than four centimeters and we found 108 patients over this period of time. And as I said, uh, this is a, a, my career is about 3,500 cases I've done. And these are the baseline characteristics, the percentage is a little bit higher in men. And you can see the different uh, acute visual acuity and field defects, which is high in these patients and endocrine dysfunction as well. The real problem with this is the NOS grading system is, is that most of these tumors have invasion of the cavernous sinus. And just to remind you what NOS grade three and four are, it's when the tumor approaches the lateral aspect of the carotid or encases the carotid. So these tumors tend to be large and invasive and they invade the carotid. And so you have or invade the cavernous sinus. So you've got cavernous sinus invasion at the beginning, which limits your resection. So if you're completely honest with your resection, unless you're removing the tumor in the cavernous sinus, which I don't do, 
in patients with binocular vision at the first operation, um, then your recurrence or your, uh, your resection rate is lower. These are the approaches that we used, and I'll show you some of my philosophy using some, uh, some illustrative cases and some of the complications that we've had. Um, I will tell you that the outcomes have been, they've been fairly good. I, uh, uh, we're a little bit better. We've had 1% mortality in this series compared to 4.4% in the literature, but we still have complications and I wanna show you what I've learned from this. So um, this is an interesting case. Uh, this actually case was published previously, but this is a 30 year old man who presented with bilateral six nerve palsies. And it was sent in to me as probably a cyst of the, uh, of the cellar and supercellar region because there was absolutely no enhancement you can see in the lesion. And this I just show you as an example of how extensive um, apoplexy can be. Now remember apoplexy is a continuum from necrosis to hemorrhage. And, it, and a lot of them have both necrosis and hemorrhage. But this is one end of the spectrum, which is unusual where you've got this apoplectic tumor uh, causing six nerve palsy, it's necrotic, the whole tumor is necrotic. And you can see that this is an indirect evidence of apoplexy, we published this before, you get mucosal thickening with apoplexy. It was originally noted by Rita in Japan, and we looked at it, it correlates directly with the severity of apoplexy. I don't know why it occurs, I presume it's uh, humoral factors released by the dying tumor. It's not pressure, um, but, but if you remove the tumor, this goes away in the next day or two. It's amazing, but it's a good indication of an acute apoplectic event, this uh, thickening of the mucosa. And this is what he looks like six months postoperatively, and you can see the tumor's been removed and there's his pituitary stalk. So when is a craniotomy necessary? These are the classic indications uh, for craniotomy as in the, in the literature. And I would say um, the, another cr uh, indication I would add is cranial neuropathy from cavernous sinus invasion. And I'll show you why in a case that I'll show you. Um, let me show you these cases to consider. Here's a 57 year old woman with cognitive decline and visual loss. She's gained hundred pounds over the last six months. You can see the tumor, she's got hydrocephalus. Uh, the cell is enlarged, that's a good indication. It's a pituitary tumor. And then she's got this massive tumor extending up into the transcranial space here. So I came in, this was, uh, the prolactin level was normal here. So we came in from below initially, and I wouldn't have done this uh, this way now, but you can see that I tried everything to get this down um, with an endoscope, uh, with all different curettes, but I couldn't get the roof to come down. It's just too large and it's too eccentric. And so what we did is we came in the next day and removed the remaining tumor transcranially. Uh, let me show you this case. Here's another example, uh, anterior extension of the supracellar component, giant tumor, large cella, pituitary tumor. Um, and he came in with cognitive decline. We did a transphenoidal and you can see what happened here. We got part of the tumor out. I couldn't get it to drop. And the remaining part of the tumor had an apoplexy. And I had to go back in the middle of the night and remove the rest of the tumor transcranially. And I just want to remind all the young people, this is a feared complication of partial resection of these large and giant tumors. It occurs in roughly 10%. And I really think that this is the most deadly complication that you're going to run into with these tumors because you can have apoplexy, they're prone to apoplexy. And if, you, if you, uh, you basically remove part of the tumor, you cause a shift in the remaining part of the tumor and you can cause apoplexy. And then the patient can get into trouble. Um, so this has changed my thinking about this completely. And what I like to do is I like to control the mass of the tumor with the first surgery, whether you need to do it combined or whether you can do it through one approach but if you don't think the tumor is going to come down, and this is a classic case, I would never think that this tumor would come down properly transnasally. Maybe you'll get this part out, but you certainly won't get this part out. So we'll come in transcranial on this pace. And if you follow the axis of the tumor, you can go right down to the cella. And so here's an example at large cella. You could do it in two approaches. 
but you can do this through one approach. And if you come down the trans, uh, the, the tumor corridor that you're making, you can get down to the cella and remove the tumor in the cell as well. So this was one transcranial approach. So exposure of cella by transcranial route. Um, so let me show you a few cases here as an example of, of difficulties that you can get into. Here's another one with a lot of subfrontal uh, extension. And um, so this is an example of these tumors can be apoplectic to start with. So this is at the opening and you can see this tumor has had <laughs> as remote hemorrhage. And so when you remove this tumor, you wanna be cognizant of where the pituitary is. And obviously you're gonna decompress the optic nerve. Here's the um, uh, carotid bifurcation here, and I'm dissecting the tumor off the frontal lobe. And we'll go ahead and remove the tumor. We'll debulk it, decompress the optic nerves, decompress the vasculature, and then you wanna be cognizant of when you approach the region of the residual pituitary tumor or the pituitary gland. And what you'll see here is you'll end up, the gland will be pushed posteriorly and I'll end up exposing the gland and I'll try to preserve the gland. If you come completely uh, extra capsular all the time, you run a risk of devascularizing the gland and interfering with the stalk. And what you're looking for here is you're looking for now, I'm pushing the gland forward from the back. And what we'll do is you'll end up with a tumor that's coming out of the residual gland here. Now I've got the residual gland and I'm very careful to try and preserve that. It's like a catcher's mitt. The tumor grows from the gland and then, and then it gets displaced by the tumor. And so at the end, We'll try to preserve the gland as much as we can. And so here's his post-op scan and good resection. Um, here's an interesting indication. And I think this, um, I think a lot of people would choose to come at this uh, transnasally, but I chose to come at this transcranially for a single reason here. If you look, this is a woman's had radiation in the past. She's got primary recurrence in her cavernous sinus and in her cella. So you could make a case, well, do you come in from below or do you come in from above? And here's the tumor, coronal imaging, and you can see she's got at least as much mass lateral to the carotid as she does medial to the carotid. So you can make a case either way. She's got diplopia already. So in this case, I'm much more aggressive and we'll go ahead and choose an approach to try and remove the tumor it gives you a bit of a license here when they've got diplopia, you can go ahead and be more aggressive with the tumor in the cavernous sinus. She's had radiation and our radiation therapist did not want to radiate her again. So we'll use an extended middle fossa, Dolink approach, peel up the lateral wall, of the cavernous sinus as taught to us by Dolink and Hakuba many years ago. And we'll try to find a window into the tumor. And what you need to understand here is that the tumor is growing medially to laterally. So it's pushing all the nerves laterally. The only nerve that I'm concerned about here, obviously five is in the wall and I can see that, but I don't know where the sixth nerve is. So that's what I'm looking for. All through this case, I'm looking for the sixth nerve. And you'll see, I find it. She's, she had a six nerve palsy already. And I do find the sixth nerve, but you'll see it's, it's completely divided when I find it. There's the sixth nerve. Okay, so, so what do you do? Well, we can go back to, reason, to the region of Dorello's canal in this case, and you're there, just take out the posterior part of the tumor and find the other end of the nerve as it exits Dorello's canal here. And freshen it up and then go ahead and uh, reanastomosis. Remember that the fourth nerve and the sixth nerve, if I find them divided by the tumor or I, I can't leave them in continuity when I remove the tumor, I always try to repair them. Now, the reason I chose a transcranial approach for this is I think that this is much de better done from a transcranial approach than an internasal approach. And so that's the reason that I chose a transcranial approach on this case. And here's the uh, post-op scan. 
and she's had uh, a good resection of the tumor. And you can see a little bit of fat that we left in the uh, cavernous sinus. Transcolossal approach. This is a case um, that uh, Chandrasekhar Dupajara and I did in Bombay, India. Um, this is a 36 year old man who has a giant adenoma that they tried two different approaches on an endonasal approach and a transcranial frontotemporal approach. And they said it was very, very firm and they couldn't get anything out. So he's got hydrocephalus, he's got a VP shunt in place. And we'll come again down the axis of the tumor. And so what we'll do here is come transcolosally. And so we're doing a transcolosal resection. You can see the, the colosum that we've opened here. And we'll go ahead and debulk the tumor and come right down the axis of the tumor. And then <clears throat> the important point I'd like to make is that this takes you right down into the cella. And so it, it actually is a perfect view to the cella. You don't need to augment a transnasal approach for this. But the tumor did go in to the region. And you'll see here, I'm removing, there's the enlarged cella already. And we're removing the floor of the cella. And we're removing the tumor right up to the, where the tumor extends into the cavernous sinus there. And so we'll stop there. It's a great approach. Um, we plug up the opening to avoid a hygroma using some gel foam, and a little bit of fiber and glue here. And here's his post-op scan with tumor in the cavernous sinus. And so here's the original tumor. Um, and here's the post-op scan. The tumor was, uh, this was actually true with gamma knife radio surgery because it, it grew after surgery. So, um, but he's done well. So this is the approaches that I've used in this large series that's being published. Um, and you can see standard transphenoidal in the majority, um, frontotemporal, subfrontal, these are all your windows, transcortical and transcolosal. Um, and again, the workhorse, transphenoidal and probably frontotemporal in most cases. Other tips uh, in conclusion here, um, this is something that uh, we've noted that you can see these cysts around these giant adenomas and much more common than in meningiomas. You can see them in meningiomas, obviously, but they're quite common in, in these pituitary tumors. And, and Ann Osborne was the one that taught me this, is that this is trap CSF, but the point being that it actually helps with your resection because again, it dissects around the tumor. If you come in transcranially, it really helps with your resection. Um, this is an important one. And this is when you get cavernous sinus invasion of the tumor, the tumor enters the cavernous sinus and then it exits the cavernous sinus. It can exit through the oculomotor cistern, okay? And so what you see here is you see the oculomotor cistern on this T2 image. And you can see the third nerve going through the cistern before it goes into the primary, into the cavernous sinus um, directly. And then this, here, the oculomotor cistern is obliterated with tumor. And so you can see this on the preoperative imaging. Here's another case here. So you see the oculomotor cistern in a coronal T2 or a Fiesta image. And on the right side, the oculomotor cistern is filled with tumor. Now, why is that important? It's important for this reason, because here's a cartoon showing this. So here you have tumor growing up through the diaphragm in this case into the cavernous sinus. And the path of least resistance is the growth through the oculomotor cistern. And so this is a common place where the tumor exits the oculomotor cistern. The point being that if you remove the tumor transnasally, you will never see this component unless you open up the diaphragm and look laterally. Case in point, uh, here's a gentleman uh, presented with this large tumor, visual loss. Here's his pituitary gland in stock. I told him that I'd remove the tumor, but I'd leave this component because it's coming out the oculomotor cistern here. And lo and behold, I did that and he developed apoplexy in the residual tumor. And I had to go back in transcranial and remove that. I don't know what I would have done differently in retrospect, um, but it is a risk and it's good to counsel your patients this way. And finally, I will just tell you a little about a little trick that we use. So remember most of these tumors are soft. So if you do have these tumors where the, the 
dura of the medial cavernous sinus wall is pushed out, uh, but it's still contained by the dura. You can actually extrude some of that tumor uh, through a transfemoidal approach. And what we do here is we open up uh, carefully um, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, and we work, work laterally to the internal carotid in this direction, and then also in the anterior loop of the carotid here. Now, you've got to be careful because the sixth nerve runs right close uh, to the carotid uh, if you come in through this corridor and you can injure it, so be careful with that. But we'll use the same tricks that we use to get the tumor to drop. If there's, if the, if there's no CSF leak, you can use a Valsalva or you can use bilateral jugular venous compression and you can get tumor to extrude um, through this area. We call it this the tooth-based extrusion technique. And you can see this case where we've removed all, we've pushed a lot of that tumor from the medial uh, or lateral to the carotid here out of the cavernous sinus. Um, so indirect removal is feasible. What are the unresolved issues? I think the issue with cavernous sinus invasion is a real important one. When we treat that, and we still um, struggle with this, and there's differences of opinion even in our own department about this, I like to wait and see the tumor grow in the cavernous sinus or have the patient develop new symptoms before I treat them because I've had such complications with radiation over time of uh, lesions in the cavernous sinus. Uh, but this is yet to be resolved, the timing of when to treat this. So in conclusion, uh, giant pituitary tumors are still a treacherous problem. Mortality has improved. Complete resection is not possible in most cases because of cavernous invasion. Large functional tumors, uh, growth hormone screening especially, are really problematic. Control the mass to avoid apoplexy. This is a really important message for the young people and multimodal treatment is necessary in most cases. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Professor, for your excellent uh, presentation. Is there any question from uh, panelists? Okay, Sam Kiyosi, I'd like to invite you to uh, the second room. It's uh, Zoom uh, launch. For more discussion and the question. Yeah, I'd um, like to, yeah, I'd like to personally uh, invite uh, William. Yeah, we're try William, we're trying to increase the interactivity and the networking. So we've, sure. we've created another room, a Zoom room for you to go to. I put the link in your chat. You leave this and go to that Zoom room. There are a couple of med students there. Which, just so you get to meet them and they get to meet you in the flesh. <laughs> Not almost Wonderful. the flesh. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. It's Thank been you. an honor. I appreciate it.